We first started getting interested in how the brain is different, how it functions differently in depression by um, just giving people tasks in the fMRI scanner. Um, and, and our first idea, because we had done studies of brain structures in depression, our thought was, oh, well, some of these limbic structures like hippocampus or amygdala, because we had found data that showed they got smaller with depression, well, maybe their activity will be less. So we did very simple tasks in the scanner, looking at um, faces, um, and then had people look at the faces and simply tell us, was it a man or a woman? But what we were interested in was how were they reacting to the emotion of the faces. And what we found was in the amygdala, this part of the brain that's very concerned with what the external environment is and what the emotional state of the world is, or if there's a snake that you suddenly see or uh, a, a fearsome person, we found that, in, that contrary to our, our ideas, actually the amygdala was what had increased activity. So that was our first foray into this area of fMRI brain activation. Um, and then we followed that up with... Depressive with person. In, in depression, right. And that was... Uh, we started those studies in 1997. And since then, there have been lots and lots of people who have found this increased activity in the limbic system. Um, and then since then, we've been trying to figure out, you know, what is the whole circuitry of disorders um, in depression? Is it not just the limbic system, but, you know, the whole brain gets involved in depression. And we found that in prefrontal cortex, the thinking areas of the brain, there was less activity. So there was kind of this imbalance. And that's been seen in a number of other groups also, that the, the prefrontal thinking areas of the brain have less activity, the limbic areas have too much activity. Um, and then when you treat people, those get more into balance. So um, we had done a lot of those kinds of studies, and we did a new task where we had people try and regulate their emotions. So we gave them the job, look at these pictures. It would be maybe something like a snarling dog or something that's kind of scary. Now, think a pleasant thought. You know, Get yourself to focus less on the, the fearful aspect of this, and imagine that the dog is behind barbed wire, or imagine that this, this scene that's kind of unpleasant is in a movie, so it doesn't really pertain to you. Um, and what we found was that people with depression had increased activity in a number of the same limbic regions we'd found before, but also in these regions called the default mode network areas, they didn't turn the areas down. So a normal person, when they're doing a task, they engage their brain actively in the task, and they shut down areas in the default mode network. Well, the people with depression, so let's say the, the brain wave should look like this. It's kind of a, a, a decreased activity. In the depressed person, it might look like this. It didn't have that downward shutting off area. As they brought on other cognitive areas of the brain that need to be thinking about doing the task, the default mode areas should be shutting down, but in, de in depression it wasn't. Well, what are the different areas that d the default mode network does? It, it's a, an area that's kind of contemplating the future, surveilling the internal milieu, what's going on inside the person, um, all of these kinds of thinking, planning, anticipating kinds of regions. And so that seems to go awry in depression. We, we still don't have the answer about what happens with the default mode network as a whole with treatment. Um, we know that some regions, the limbic regions, when you treat a person with antidepressants, the amygdala, the hippocampus that are overly active in depression do return to, to normal functioning with treatment. We're actually looking right now at a different form of treatment, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is also a very effective form of treatment where the person learns to modulate particular emotional responses um, in, in response to instructions. So the person, for instance, might be thinking, I'm a bad person. And the therapist makes them aware that they're having these thoughts that are really self-destructive um, and gives them homework about noticing them and then stopping them. So that's a, one example from cognitive behavioral therapy. But it, it's a whole 12-week to 16-week course of therapy that 
teaches the person to think about themselves differently. And this, is, this has been remarkably effective in patients with depression. And if you look across different disorders, people have looked in schizophrenia now. There are alterations in the default mode network in schizophrenia, in depression, in bipolar illness, um, in Alzheimer's disease, in Parkinson's disease. Um, I think I think I remember reading a report of Hunting's, Huntington's disease. So, so I, would, I would imagine that basically every kind of dementia and most psychiatric illnesses would have some kind of aberration in the default mode network.